I'm, not, I'm yeah. definitely not putting this in the podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. Off the record. But, way off the record. <laughs> Greetings across whatever you listen to podcasts on. This is the Silent Film Music Podcast with Ben Modell. It's the podcast that takes you inside the mind of someone as they prepare for, perform, and reflect upon performances of live musical accompaniments to silent films. I'm Ben Modell. I'm a silent film accompanist, historian, composer, performer, presenter, educator, etc., etc. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 57. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, co-producer, and friend, Kerr Lockhart. Hi, Ben. And we're talking about today something you thought would be a good idea, which I agree is uh, the the long stretch of recording assignments I've had over the last four to six months that I'm just now coming out of. And, and we should make it clear, this is more than just uh, undercrank projects. Oh, it's awesome. a little of everything. Yeah. Um, Kino, Turner Classic Movies, and one project that's sort of a combination of the two of them on top of uh, things I have in the hopper for, for undercrank. It's a different animal recording scores than it is doing a live performance. Uh, it's it's I very to different. I want to talk about your workflow. Okay. On it, uh, so you know, how do you break the task out? I could imagine, for instance, that you might want to look at a couple of reels of the film. Say, okay, let me you know record two reels and get those fixed up until I got those two reels and then I can take a break and watch two more. I could imagine that you'd want to rough through an entire film and mm-hmm. then go back and potchkey. There are, I mean, yeah. I can imagine dozens of different ways to attack this uh, issue. And uh, and also, how, I mean, how you set, you must have interim deadlines because the big oh. deadline is too much to deal with. Yeah, yeah the, the, and then there's multiple deadlines because I have more than one project being a ball in the air or a plate that's being spun at the same time. So I'm <laughs> managing all of this. The basic workflow is I'll, I'll watch the whole, just like with a regular show, I'll watch the whole film once and take a lot of story notes. And that will help me identify, okay, here's where the love theme ha- happens for the first time. Here's where the main theme should come back. Here's where the main character's hero theme uh, fits. Oh, I have to look up whatever this thing is that's being referenced in a piece of sheet music and consider whether or not to use it. So I have all of that. And and then I sit down and begin recording. And it's it's uh, calling it just improvisation or, or winging it doesn't, doesn't really do... I, I still con- I consider it co- composition, even though I think the difference between what I'm doing and what is traditionally thought of as composition is that I'm not notating it first. But I still think it's composing. If you're notating, you're improvising, and then you have to remember what you just played and write it down. And I have found over years that by the time I pick up the pencil, <laughs> it's already half gone, mm-hmm. and then I have to remember it. So um, you have a recording device. Oh yeah, you have I mean audio recording. So yeah. that really takes the place of a pen, and you know right. why insert an additional step. Right. I'm reminded of the story Robert Preston used to tell about Art Tatum. Mm. Um, what are the reasons that people think he was the most amazing piano player of his century, certainly, was that he was in, virtually blind, and he had no oh. interim interim step from music in his head through his fingers. Mm. And in fact, Preston's story is he was sitting with Tatum, like to sit next to him while he played, and he said, I, I heard some records you made in year such and such and there were some clams i've never heard you play a clam and he mm. said oh cuz i was seeing that day so when there was something intervening oh, that's between interesting. that unconscious brain and his playing there was there was an interim step there um that was uh, misleading him so i mean yes we've had the convention for 4 or 500 years of writing music down but that's not an inherently musical process that's simply been the most it's what's been written down it's like from yeah. what little i know about the the famous german composers or, or or folks from that era beethoven mozart all those people you know they also improvise it's just what what we have is what got written down oh sure beethoven uh, i forget which he 
premiered two major symphonies on one night, and then he improvised for forty five minutes. Right. Uh, so, so you know, this is the thing, and this is the other unusual par- uh, paradox or conundrum or whatever that I've talked about before, where people tell me, "Oh, you improvise? I I can't improvise. I'm classically trained." Well, you're trained to play what Beethoven wrote down, but he. <laughs> He was winging it on some on many occasions as well. So it's still, I consider it composition, and my process has changed over the years where I would do something in a handful of very, very long takes. Uh, whereas now I, I'm really, uh, depending on the film, I mm-hmm. will do it in lots of little pieces uh, mm-hmm. and go back, and then even after the whole thing is done, I'll watch the film one more time with the track running and allow myself to disagree with what I played and mm-hmm. and use uh I use a software called Reaper which allows me to punch in and out and I'll re-record a section that I think oh you know I should have done this there so it it's still like uh uh as if I were notating it I uh, it's just that it's all done as a recording and so uh I now do it in smaller sections uh I know for a fact uh, that from my own experience, it takes me an hour and a half sometimes to get the opening titles. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's, and there's a, a few reasons for that. One is the vo- the opening titles are very important. So as we, and I'm going to talk about this later, but as Bill Perry told us uh, in the interview we had this summer, setting the tone for what's about to come is very important. And so I need to make sure I've, I'm happy with whatever main theme or main title music I've come up with. And I need to be able to play it with a certain amount of accuracy so I don't have to spend hours fixing all the wrong notes. You combine that with the pressure, which may be self-imposed, although I have a feeling a lot of my colleagues feel the same way, that when you're doing a show, that's in some ways an ephemeral score. The lights come up and it's gone. With a recording, it's there. And people who buy the Blu-ray or the DVD or watch something on TCM and DVR, and, and there's two things from that. One is it's locked to the picture. It's It becomes your score for whatever. But also, unless you're in a movie theater or uh, if you have a 70-inch OLED television uh, in a screen in your house, the sound is larger than it is in a theatrical setting, and you're much more aware of it. So in recording, I find that I'm much more aware of these circumstances and stakes. So, And I now know, don't worry, it's going to take you at least an hour to get the opening titles, and I don't have a, a huge sword of Damocles over my head about it. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes I've disagreed what I, with what I recorded, and I'll go back and come up with new main title music. I should and, have asked this before, but at what stage... Do you decide, and I'm sure this the uh, distributor is involved as well, what instrument you're going to use? Well, that it's usually on me, unless I'm I'm asked specifically, can you do it on piano or we'd like it on organ? And that took me several years from from the beginnings of when I started using the Meditzer, and now I'm using the the big kids software, the Hauptwerk and the Paramount or, uh, organ work samples, but just getting. People in general with shows and also uh, the folks at Kino used to the idea of having a theater organ score. It took a while for people to get used to it. And it went from me uh, saying, is it okay if I use the organ, to being asked to do this on organ. If you and, were going to record on piano, yeah, you know what, what, what would you use? I'm, I'm sure you're not using... Uh, the 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 piano we hear on the silent comedy watch party. No, you're not hearing that. Um, what you're hearing is uh, a digital keyboard, mm-hmm. and and I've gone through several keyboards. Every few, every five or ten years, I'll switch one. I'll, I'll upgrade one just for one reason or another. The samples will get better, or I recently switched from one one Yamaha keyboard to another one because the new ones uh, weigh about half. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just did one show where I thought, uh, I can't carry this thing anymore. Uh, so, <laughs> But the other thing that I use in instead of the onboard sounds, even though they've gotten better and better, is a set of Steinway samples by uh, uh, called Ivory. Uh, they're, they, where if you are a musician or even a piano tuner, 
if you're listening to recordings made with with the ivory software you hear they've sampled all the overtones mm-hmm. and the the multiple strike samples in other words for every instead of like a regular keyboard you hit uh, a key at uh, maybe five or six different velocities you're hearing the same recording of that key just louder and softer whereas with the higher end software like this one you're hearing what a piano hammer sounds like at that velocity and i heard about this software from roger miller from the alloy orchestra uh he's a keyboard guy among other things and that's where i first heard about this Imagine so that's what, a, what i use what a huge leap this is i mean that you can do everything in your home you don't have to go find a, a hall or uh, you don't have to find a, a theater organ. I don't know where Gaylord Carter recorded those scores oh. that were on VHS. Well, some of back those in the eighties. Well, some of those were recorded at Richard Simonton's father's house. He mm-hmm. had a home installation. Richard told me about this because of the the winning of Barbara Worth. That mm-hmm. score, for which Gaylord Carter gets no credit on screen or on the box, was done by Gaylord Carter at, at Simonton's father's home and because richard says i've recorded it so and, you know and uh, faithful listeners will call richard simonton was harold lloyd's archivist yes and then the, then the person who saved the edward everett horton shorts among other things so you can do this stuff at your home if you if you want to if you really feel the need to go into a studio that's great uh so this is both the theater organ stuff and and piano stuff is all done with digital samples on uh working with reaper where i can go back and punch in and out fixing up clams or wrong notes or well, yeah, or re-recording yeah, sections of, of a score much less worry about uh, your per minute cost than if yes, you had to go I've, rent studio time yeah i've i a billion years ago I, I i've done a couple of recording sessions and just the the self-inflicted pressure i was just talking about gets compounded by not mm-hmm. only the cost but even if it even if i was getting the studio for free there's people listening so on top, so you feel like you're performing for them, and what do they think? I mean, it's just uh, you want to remove as many <laughs> uh, complications <laughs> as possible. So you know, there's some films where the the process on uh, whether it's just the opening titles or just getting through the first reel, where I I find that it's kind of, it's like the movement of trying to pull start a, an old power mower. <laughs> where <laughs> and it catches and it might take me 10 takes before I don't hit a million clams in the first two bars and I get frustrated and I have to start over but once it gets going it's mm-hmm. like you're you're uh the you're up on the water skis now and you're just like okay I'm going to keep going but I also have in my mind the notion that what I could do, I could always stop and do another take or mm-hmm. try to get to the end of the scene. And this ties into something I've talked about before is the, the practice I'm developing or have developed where I can tell when a scene is wrapping up. Plus, I have my, my written notes and I know, OK, when this scene wraps up, if I'm not in the groove, I can just resolve and take my hands off the keys and res- and just start up from there. And I've, I've done that as well. So it's it's a variety of things and sometimes I'll be I'll have a good head of steam going and I can just go for uh maybe 20 minutes or so and I'll be fine and then there there will be sequences in a film where I have to do you know one minute pieces over and over where I get so far and then ah I got to stop here and but I know I can stop and go back record from that point and uh digitally cut it and slide it into place cuz I'm I'm working with time code which is those those that ten digit string of numbers or however many digits it is that you often see if you ever get to see a screener or something. Often the themes will get composed while I'm noodling and before I start recording, and sometimes just like at a show, a theme will just happen, mm-hmm. and oh, that's kind of nice. And then, as as just happened with a, a a score for a Tom Mix film, we'll talk about later. I I came up with a love theme, but when I repeated it. Later in the score, it actually wasn't the same. But I was able to go back, <laughs> hear it the first time, I found that spot, mm-hmm. and then re-recorded the other two instances where the love theme goes. So 
even though it was only happening three or four times, it's a subliminal thing. I think uh, I think Bill Perry talked about this also. You don't want to hit people over the head with it, but just enough so that it, it psychologically uh, makes it all come come together. And again, the recording becomes your pen, becomes your uh, yeah. notation system. I, cons- I consider it that way, and it's not something that I have to, as with my orchestral scores, have to write it down so because other people are going to play this. I only need to play it the one time so it's good and then it's locked and I'm set. We wanted to talk about some things. I, I've been recording a lot and really since the last last fall, the fall of 2022. One thing or another, there was the the two Raymond Griffith scores the two Tom Mix scores that I did for Undercrank and TCM. And then on top of that, there was the score we talked about it on a previous episode that I did for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There were a pair of Tom Mix restorations that the Museum of Modern Art did that they wanted to get scored for their virtual cinema. Uh, there was uh, a Rin Tin Tin film that I needed to record uh, on a very tight deadline for uh, a Kino slash TCM. And I'm sure I'm forgetting a few other things, but all of this happened at the same time that a lot of in-person stuff came back. And so I had all these projects that I thought I was going to have time for. Then suddenly I didn't want to say no to a lot of the in-person bookings. And so I was kind of saddled with, with all of this. But I think what we wanted to talk about first is something I did in scoring a Tom Mix film. The Best Bad Man was released in 1925, and it stars Tom Mix, along with uh, character actor Tom Wilson and somebody named Clara Bow. This was a, a digital restoration undertaken by the Museum of Modern Art, working from, uh, I believe it's a preservation that had Czech uh, titles, C-Z-E-C-H, Czech uh, titles, uh, one of the many films that was preserved during, during the time that Eileen Bowser was the uh, head of the archive. So there's a scan is done, brand new English uh, intertitles are created either from a cutting continuity, I think was the case, and there's some digital cleanup and tinting uh, done. This was going to be produced for a video that would be streamed on MoMA's virtual cinema for a few weeks, and that would be it. There are currently no plans for this to be made available on home video. In case you were wondering, don't don't ask me, that's the answer to that. So there, there were a couple of things about this film that uh, I wanted to share as as examples. So his character is a sort of a wealthy guy who lives in New Orleans, and there's some scenes of foot and footage of Mardi Gras, and something happens with some property he owns out west. He gets the idea to go with his sidekick out to, to this property halfway across the country and, and check it out, and goes uh, under an assumed name so that nobody knows in this little town that he's the guy who owns the mine or whatever it is. And for some reason, and this is according to the titles, and I'm, uh, it, there's a title that transitions from Tom Mix in, in his fancy house in New Orleans to this other town. There's a title that says that he comes to town, and then we see him, and then there's a title introducing him to us, the audience, saying he has arrived in town. He is known only as, in quotes, the word jingle bells to people. And it's never explained why. And he, he, he shows up in town as a, a traveling musician uh, who sells saxophones or something wacky like that. But there's this title card that says Jingle Bells. So what do you do? So what you'll hear in this first sh- very short clip is the transition from wealthy property owner Tom Mix in New Orleans into this next town. And then you'll hear me mention Jingle Bells musically just enough so that you know, yes, I saw that title. But this playing all of Jingle Bells is not necessary, and I, I transition out of it into the rest of the scene. So you'll you'll hear that in this in this short clip. is a song that doesn't take much to establish what it is. You play 
the, two bars. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the the three co- the chord three times twice. Um, right. Dot 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 dot. Yeah, and that's I exactly what you what you hear in in the recording. I just play mm-hmm. two and a half bars of Jingle Bells and then turn it into something else and and get out of there. Just just to let you know. Because you don't want people to think, why isn't he playing it's, Jingle Bells? Because it's, it's almost so re- like a sampling in hip hop. <laughs> exactly. So you have to acknowledge it, but you don't need to dwell on it at all. So that's that's that clip. And then the the second clip uh, I wanted to play is a sequence where there's this meet cute at the the mining camp uh, with between Tom Mix and uh, the other female lead, who's sort of also has fallen in love with or falls in love with Tom Mix along with Clara Bow. We have this thing. Then we cut to the two bad guys who are plotting something. Back to Tom and the young woman. We fade out. And then there's a title that says, And with the dusk, and then two dashes, letting us know now it's nighttime. And then, so I needed to transition from this sort of industrious or whatever the scene is. And you'll you'll hear it into, it doesn't say night. <laughs> it says, And with the dusk. So I need to play something to let you know, okay, now it's nighttime in case you didn't understand the title. However, what follows is a scene in a graveyard. Now, Tom Mix's sidekick is played by Tom Wilson. And Tom Wilson is playing a, an African-American person. This this happened a lot in the 20s. And the thing I've noticed is that if, if it's a short, here are your bags, sir, and leaving kind of a thing, they will hire and cast an actual African-American person. But if it's a supporting character that's important, they will hire somebody as as you see in seven chances they'll hire somebody to to put on blackface um and per- portray this character and so there's a scene in a graveyard it's meant to be funny it's not that funny today um, but at the time it was hilarious and so you know what the scene is i had to transition into that and, and, and it's a it's an uncomfortable gag anyway and but you need to let the audience know this is supposed to be a comedy scene, whether you think it's funny or not. This is you know I'm playing what's on what's in the film mm-hmm. uh, without making up. And then at some point after there's a couple of scare gags, Tom Mix shows up and the two of them have have their scene and they they go on. So you're going to hear the the end of the meet cute scene at the mining camp going briefly transitioning briefly into it's nighttime and then right into the sort of. Uh, comedy sneaking around music in this clip from The Best Mad Men. This clip, Ben, I couldn't believe uh, how close you came to what I remember as a kid hearing as the great cliche, not so much of film, but of the melodramas that immediately oh, preceded yeah. them. Of the you, you go, you do up the um, uh, the the minor uh, triad, yeah. Bum, yeah. Dum, bum, 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 and then you come back down yeah. with the minor right. seventh it's, it's chord. A pe- da, da, it's, da, da, da. <laughs> it's a piece called Misterioso Pizzicato from 1916. I, 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 I either looked late? it up. Uh, so they, it's that early, yeah. I mean, yeah. That, no, but that's I mean, what, you know, I as I say, I associate it more with performances of the drunkard. It's it's quite possible it existed <laughs> earlier, but it, it was first published, I believe, in 1916. I forget huh. if Rick Benjamin or Rodney Sauer helped me to that, but that that's what that piece is. But again, it, I wanted it to the audience to know this is supposed to be a joke, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, even though it isn't funny. And th- the other thing, and this is it has nothing to do with music, but this is something I've observed over the last few years of, of watching a lot of silent comedy shorts, is that this practice of having sequences, not a quick throwaway gag, but sequences of fright gags with African-American either performers or people per- portraying them, seems to peak in, in 1924 and 1925. A lot of times you think, oh, all silent movies have this. But it's re- there's all, you would not believe the, how often 
this comes up in films from 1924 and 1925. And it's a topical reference that I have not been able to trace in a, in a literal sense, in the way that prohibition may be mentioned literally or, mm-hmm. uh, it, you know, uh, there's that incident in 1926 when Prince uh, Prince of Wales fell off his horse, and then for the next 18 months there are title gags about Prince Prince you know the Prince of Wales and and horse mm-hmm. horsemanship. The only thing I can connect so far is the fact that 1924 is a is a year where the Klan has a peaks its uh, membership and has a major major presence at the Democratic National Convention in March of 1924. There was something to me, yeah. That there was something going on, and and at the end of twenty four, I found in doing research uh, in the trades there, the, uh, United Artists reissued uh, "Birth of a Nation" in the beginning of twenty five, mm. and there are uh, there are promotions for this new uh, uh, edition that was going to come out that that you see ads for it at the end of twenty four. So it's a, there's nothing literal, but there must have been something in the zeitgeist where. Um, this stereotype of being fr- easily frightened by anything. I, I, I don't I don't know. And I would, if anybody knows the answer... Yeah, we're and crowdsourcing has a, the question now. Yeah, I, I've asked a few people, and, and, and everyone's got, oh, interesting, I hadn't noticed that. Because we always think, oh, it's everywhere. But it really... It's occasional. It's, it's, it's the entire plot of Haunted Spooks with Harold Lloyd. And there's a couple of gags here and there, but you really see standalone sequences where the rest of the cast goes away and there's just or, you know Edgar Washington or Spencer Bell doing a sequence of, of fright gags that goes on for about a minute and a half for no apparent reason and, and if you remove it from the film it actually helps the film today because it's no longer funny yeah and interestingly no other indices of of uh, racial inferiority it's just Easily Scary frightened gags. by anything. Nothing. This none of the stereotypes. And and this is the thing that in Go West with a Buster Keaton film, there's a sequ- again. It's about seventy five seconds of screen time in the middle of the stampede. And all I remember uh, about Go West is Keaton saying they got stuck because how do you have this big chase with a bunch of cattle standing around? We had to keep it moving. And then to insert something that stops the flow literally for about a minute and twenty seconds. There was something extremely that people, white America, thought was hilarious in 1924 and 25. So it's just, it's an observation. I just, at, at any rate, that's why when we get to that scene, I it, this is an, an instance of uh, no, trying to understand what is in the film, knowing it was done deliberately for an audience at the time, and then helping a contemporary audience understand the shift of what's ha- what's happening. Okay, this is supposed to be a comedy sequence. Just to give them a little hint that it, as uncomfortable as it may be, this is intended a- a- as ga- as gags and not just terror. Mm-hmm. So looking at our listening statistics, Ben, one of our most popular episodes, or two of our most popular episodes, were the interviews with Bill Perry. Well, thank goodness. Uh, that we did last summer. They went over That's great. big. And, I'm uh, glad to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to be proud of there. And uh, you told me that Bill Perry was on your mind or in your fingers um, as you were scoring the Tom Mix film Sky High. Yeah. So Sky High is one of two Tom Mix features that Undercrank Productions has restored. I didn't do the restoration. The restoration work was done by Katie Pratt or Catherine Pratt. Uh, her company is 5135 Kensington. Uh, she has done many, many biograph shorts for, for the Film Preservation Society's project. Uh, she did a wonderful job on these two films. These are both new 2K scans of archival material f- uh, from the Library of Congress, uh, on, especially on Sky High. And these will be aired on Turner Classic Movies in May, and they'll be out on Blu-ray and DVD at some point in the summer. Uh, Sky High is a, a film that was added to the National Film Registry in 1998 and has, like anything that Tom Mix was in, has never been given a home video release beyond the alpha video or grapevine level of, 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 of a project. And I felt like this was a, a good a good thing to do, considering Tom Mix was never off screen for 
from the moment he moved into feature length in the late teens until 1929. He made six, sometimes seven or eight, five or six real features every year. And the one thing you knew when you were watching a, a, a Tom Mix movie that is that two months later there'd be a new one for you to go see. And so Sky High has as its uh, one of its supporting players the Grand Canyon. Uh, according to the intertitles, the footage... Uh, of the Grand Canyons, the, 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 some of the first, maybe not if you don't count newsreels or actualities, taken. And most of the film is shot on location in the, in the Grand Canyon. And what we're going to hear now is the first two and a half minutes of my score for Sky High. And because I had been met with Bill Perry and spent time with him and listened to m- the raw recording and then listened to the uh, the edit and then watch, listened to it again, um, I, I was trying to figure out to your other question, should I do this on organ or piano? And it's a 1922 picture, and theater organ might be appropriate for that. I do like to do, if I'm doing two features, one on piano and one on theater organ, uh, so people get the variety. And uh, for people who don't like the organ, like the person who wrote to me and said, the sound of the theater organ sets his teeth on edge, could you please do more piano scores? There are some people who don't like one and one who prefer the other. Well, that's fine. You know, I wanted to do something, I don't know, the, almost as a tribute to those silent years scores that I grew up hearing and, and just having just talked to the guy who did them. So I decided for piano on Sky High. And the, the main theme I came up for, it, which I bring around two or three other times, is what I play during the, the open, opening title music. And I remembered what he what Bill Perry was talking about, and it's something I, I try to do, but it, it was a thing that really reminded me, make sure you do this, that not only states the main theme, but lets, pe- lets people know, you know, it's almost like an announcement. Hey, the movie's starting, mm. you know. Uh, and so I had that uh, notion in the back of my head when, in coming up with the main theme and, and what I would, how I would play it in the opening title music. So Sky High, uh, like I said, it'll be on, on TCM on May 7th. It'll be out on, on disc from Undercrank Productions in the summer. If you have seen Sky High on YouTube or VHS, uh, you're seeing a brand new 2K scan of 35 preservation, and we've reinstated the film's original tinting and toning scheme. But anyway, here is the first two and a half minutes of my piano score for Sky High, starring Tom Mix. The first few minutes of my score for Sky High, starring Tom Mix, released in 1922, although it was filmed in 1921, soon to have its world re-premiere on Turner Classic Movies and then a disc release in the summer. It was a, a treat for me to get to work on, on this film, and 
the whole idea of it really was to get Tom Mix back out there to fans because he's one of those people you can mention his name and everybody knows who Tom Mix is and they've never seen one of his films and maybe they know what he looks like. Well, it's the a, root cause is the low survival rate of the films themselves. That, yeah, that, that's certainly some of it. And I think the other side of it is that you can count uh, on your nose <laughs> or your ears the number of silent westerns that have been released uh, on home video by Kino or Image or Flickr Alley or Criterion. Except so. for things made by you know Ford, as they're done as add-ons to Ford at Fox. But um, they're, they're, silent westerns really haven't, considering how much of a breadwinner they were for movie theater owners and the fan base that they have, uh, they certainly deserve the, the, the criterion treatment, which I'm, we're doing the best we can well, to, you know, to, to give I, him. I think genre is always the last to come Sure, in any era. Everybody's going to want to look at the big monumental things. And uh, genre is going to have to catch up. And Westerns historically have acted out that tension between what people consider dismissible uh, throwaway entertainment sure. and and things that are actually making a statement. This is you know this is uh, you know John Ford mock humility in the nineteen forty eight or forty nine at the Waldorf meeting saying I am my name is John Ford I make westerns yeah and you know kind of doing a little bit of shit kicking but the fact <laughs> is that he is making huge westerns that are making great statements about american society and history yeah but he's you know he's painting a canvas on on a uh, a form that was originally built to pass the time for an hour or just under yeah and 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 uh, they 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 really you know they they were an important part of the movie going fabric and as 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 uh Honestly and authentically rep- representative of of the old West as they are or aren't, this is what people went to see over over and over and over and and just the fact that just to, as I've done with other leading movie stars from the silent era whose work is completely unknown uh, and then by releasing it, people will watch and say, "Wow." Why didn't I know about this? Like that, that reaction I had the first time I saw when Nighted was in flower, and I thought, why wasn't this part of the Silent Years package? Mm-hmm. It's as good as everything else. Mm-hmm. So maybe this will uh, lead to more Tom Mix films being shown. Uh, we've already got a booking for the Gene Autry Museum to show this new restoration of Sky High. So that, that's that's the idea. Uh, the other film uh, that'll be on Turner Classic Movies and also on Disc from Undercrank is a film called The Big Diamond Robbery. Uh, now, don't confuse that with The Great k a Train Robbery, which is a 1925 film that's been around forever and eminently available. This is uh, The Big Diamond Robbery from 1929. It's Tom Mix's last silent film ever made for FBO, and we restored it, uh, combining a, a preservation negative of an American release that has some quality issues with a French uh, release print from Nitrate called Tom Le Tigre, uh, which uh, was in the collection of lobster films. So we use those two to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And those that's a film that nobody has seen since 1929. <laughs> So we have not had um, a sponsorship announcement on the podcast for a number of months. But well, I haven't had a, I haven't much had many releases in, in quite a little while, and you've managed to to plug everything I've released at this point. <laughs> but as you just referred to uh, in the previous segment, most of the releases are built around performing personalities that are lesser known: Alice Howell, Edward Everett Horton, Douglas MacLean, or the lesser known work of Lon Chaney. This month, Undercrank has released maybe its most ambitious-looking package ever, and but the personality is not a performer. It's the noted director, Frank Borzaghi, who uh, went on long into the sound era. Oh, gosh, Major yeah. hits with, I first knew him from The Mortal Storm and Four Brothers, uh, these uh, famous, powerful, humanistic dramas. 
when you see those films from the 30s and 40s, if you're a film buff, you'll probably say, I bet this director started the silent era because he's taking an awful lot of care with how the film looks. I always think that's the hallmark of that first generation. And Frank Borzaghi, I understand, is a protege of Thomas Ince. Wouldn't surprise me. I, I, sh- I should know that, being a, a, a fan of Thomas Ince and, and uh, somebody who tries to get the word out about about uh, the importance of Thomas Ince. Because... I, I, I learned it from the really nice uh, video essay Bob, that you'll find on this oh, package, and it's the the, yeah. the package. You should say is the the films are back pay and the Valley of Silent Men. Yeah, the and, and the most Frank Borzaghi. Yeah. And this is a project. Just you know, this is an undercrank production release, but this is an Andrew Simpson project. Andrew Simpson, another film accompanist who uh, I've known for many years, so going back to the slapstick on era and mostly lost and everything else, uh, but. Andrew uh, played a show of uh, a restoration that the Library of Congress had done of back pay. And the, it's gotten leaked to YouTube, the, the, the film, I mean. So if you want, you can go, go look at it in whatever resolution is on, on YouTube. Um, but it, it had only existed up to that point, I believe, uh, out of sequence. Uh, J.B. Kaufman uh, wrote in his blog uh, a review about the film and had recalled having only seen the film out of order. But... Andrew played this show and was so taken with the film, he decided this is something he wanted to do as a Kickstarter and approached me about it. And I said, sure, go, go right ahead. I knew that the name Bo- Frank Borzaghi would mean something. The fact that the film was uh, written by Francis Marion is also important. And, and the other side of it is that these are two films made directly by Frank Borzaghi uh, for Cosmopolitan Productions, meaning they were produced by William Randolph Hearst, who made sure he had prints of everything ever uh, produced, which meant that Marion Davies uh, was the film conservationist, and it's because of Marion Davies and her giving all of her film to the Library of Congress that we can see these things at all. And I think that uh, the the video essay that Andrew wrote and made together with Crystal Cutty uh, really uh, does it. He does a great job uh, on this very brief 1922 period of Borzaghi's. The Silent Film Music Podcast with Ben Modell is brought to you by Undercrank Productions, home of the neglected and the unexpected in vintage film. The new double feature package, Frank Borghese, 1922 Silence, include Back Pay, starring Cena Owen, a romantic melodrama written by Francis Marion from a novel by Fanny Hurst in the manner of humoresque and a woman of Paris. And The Valley of Silent Men, starring Lou Cody in a rugged outdoor melodrama with spectacular photography by Chester Lyons. The films are tented and feature original scores by Andrew Simpson on piano and theater organ, respectively. Film historian J.B. Kaufman named Back Pay his film of the month, writing, Back Pay and The Valley of Silent Men, both ripe for rediscovery, are now a welcome addition to any silent film aficionado's library. Frank Borzaghi 1922 Silence is available from Amazon, Deep Discount, Movies Unlimited, Critics' Choice, and Wow HD. Kaufman writes, Once again, we're indebted to Undercrank Productions, Andrew Earl Simpson, the Library of Congress, and Associates for retrieving another precious slice of our film heritage. Why don't you help yourself to a slice and order a copy for your own collection? That's Frank Borzaghi 1922 Silence. So, yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that, that how ambitious it is. And I think one of the fun things that's happened is that uh, in releasing this, you know, you mentioned Borzaghi. A lot of eyebrows go up and eyes eyes light up. Uh, and people know his other films. But what's fun, and this is, again, something that Andrew points out in, 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 uh, in the video essay, is how many of the things that you think of visually as Borzaghi touches 
from laser, later films are in these. Mm-hmm. Here's some film lineage. Back pay is acknowledged by Charlie Chaplin as an influence on A Woman of Paris. Right, that's something that that, uh, that Andrew uh, found in his research. He and Crystal did did the best they could to make sure to to corroborate that. But yeah, I, I, you could see a, a line from from back pay to Woman of Paris to everything that followed. Well, uh, Ernst Lubitsch, Woman of Paris. Ernst Lubitsch claimed that his entire work is all stems from A Woman of Paris. Oh yeah, I mean you that can everything see everything's based on that movie. You know, what, whatever comes before Marriage Circle. And then the marriage circle going through, you know, uh, Lady Windermere's fan, etc. This is a before and after for Lubitsch. It's uh, def- definitely. So uh, it's, it's a great set. Marlene Weissman outdid herself, as always, on the cover design. It's a cover design where you can look at it and admire it. Then you watch back pay, and then the front cover has a whole new meaning all over again. If you, oh, it's if ab- you buy this, you'll understand what yeah, I'm talking about. Yeah, it's absolutely astonishing. And uh, yeah, yeah. Crystal is becoming the new... Laurent Bozero with these video <laughs> essays. Well, thank goodness, because I, I don't like doing booklets. There, I, I can't do booklets with manufacturer on demand. And um, this was the idea from the first one we did with Horton. It was it was Crystal's idea, and it's now it's going to be something I, I have to do one on everything uh, <laughs> because it, it 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 gives you what you need from a booklet. It's it's like the interstitial things you'll see on Turner Classic Movies. But it gives you just enough background so you can appreciate what you're watching without having to get out a magnifying glass to read a a booklet. (laughs) Let's talk about the fact tracks, which apparently bedeviled you. What what Kerr is referencing is something that we did on the Frank Borzaghi project that is akin to the old pop-up videos from from VH1 a million years ago. There was some Zoom call that me and Steve and Andrew and a bunch of our buddies were were on talking about the film and somehow the, this idea came up to ha- have in, to insert facts it came out of a discussion we were all having about commentary tracks and how sometimes they're just not great and sometimes they're basically podcasts that don't line up with what you're watching. Sometimes people say, "Yeah, let's watch the movie for a few minutes and I'll be back." And all you really need are the tidbits. Mm-hmm. And I had this idea, or Andrew or Steve, or we had this idea of doing them as stub titles. We were informally calling it a fact track, although I think that term already exists somewhere and I didn't want to uh, co-opt something. So, But it, it, it's a subtitle track where uh, Andrew did some research on some locations or other interesting aspects of the film, and then I had to figure out how to create a subtitle track in Adobe Encore. Uh, which uh, takes a lot of math and math that's based on a clock and seconds and frames. It's it was a lot of work, but uh, I, I'm I'm glad you're enjoying it. And if uh, I don't know if I'd ever do it again because because of what was involved. But if I can find a way to streamline the process and if people are enjoying it, I may I may do it for something else because uh, a fa- a commentary track is a lot of work and even to do one. Uh, but just to list a bunch of facts and f- plop them in at the right moment where, oh, this is, you know, this is such and such an actor. You know, uh, you, uh, if, if there was time and money to hire Steve to do this for one of the Griffith films, the Raymond Griffith films, that would be wonderful to do. But an- another time, he's too busy and I'm too busy. I will say that one of the reasons I've learned how to do subtitling is that I have made sure to subtitle the video essays. Uh, one of the people who has backed almost all of my projects uh, is deaf, and mm-hmm. I'm aware of that. And it's occurred to me that if there's somebody who wants to buy one of these DVDs who is hard of hearing or is deaf, silent film is silent film, and they don't need to hear my score. But if we include the video essay, it would be great for people to be able to know what it is. Otherwise, it's a bunch of still pictures panning back and forth mm-hmm. and they don't know what it is. I had made a point of learning how to do subtitling for that and this was just an extension of it. So you've so, mentioned scoring for TCM and mm. uh, the third piece of that puzzle recently is uh, I believe celebrating part of the centennial of Warner Brothers with their yeah. biggest star uh, Rin Tin Tin, yeah, yeah. Rin Tin Tin, a German Shepherd. <laughs> uh, I have to tell my students every year when I when I get to this point, when I show my students Lady Windermere's fan, 
And it's a Warner Brothers picture from 1925. And I explained to them their big star when they started was a German Shepherd. Uh, we all know Warner Brothers as Warner Brothers, but that that's what they started with. So I've been invited to play for a silent film at the Turner Classic Movies Film Festival in Hollywood then in April of 2023. And they uh, decided to show... Because I don't know how much of this was their idea or because I pitched it or both, but every year, as soon as they announce the theme, I come up with a bunch of pictures and I pitch them. And usually... Two things happen simultaneously. One is they don't take the suggestions. Two, I get booked for something anyway and it has nothing to do with the theme, which is fine with me. <laughs> but this time I was thinking, oh, uh, what's a hook? Oh, the Warner Brothers Centennial. I started looking. Well, there's the, you know, MoMA has restored uh, Lady Windermere's fan and the marriage circle. But, oh, you know, Rin Tin Tin. There's a couple of, oh, there's one of them, uh, The Clash of the Wolves. Uh, was restored by the Library of Congress. It was a National Registry title, and I suggested that one. A lot of the Rin Tin Tin films only survive in 16mm show-at-home prints. But here's one uh, of, I think, two or three that survives in 35. And a month or two later, uh, I I got an email, are you are you available? So I was booked in December. And then uh, a, f- a few weeks later, I get an email. This is where TCM and Kino sort of cross paths here. I get an email from Brent Wood at Kino. Are you working on a score for Clash of the Wolves? TCM is wants to show it, and they, they're going to get it from us, but they want the Ben Modell score. Well, that's nice. That's a great story to tell my mom. Mm-hmm. And so I said, yeah, of course, as I thought, and as Mana also said to me, she said, well, you're probably just going to sit down and play it in April. But Kino is working on a box set of silent films that have dogs in them and that's going to be out at either at the end of this year or beginning of next year it's a long-term project with many many titles one of them happens to be clash of the wolves and this film was made available on i think the second treasures from american film archives box set a million years ago in standard def and if you go to youtube or alpha video you can find that version bootlegged but they're doing a brand new two or four K scan of the nitrate well, so you want the Ben Modell score? Okay. Yes, yeah, so they want to air this in April. Can you do this by whatever date? Uh, 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 okay. <laughs> so I, I told Tom Mix and Raymond Griffith, hold on a second. Uh, I'm going to spin this other plate now. <laughs> Set up the organ and, and worked on the score for Clash of the Wolves. I've, se- I've seen and played for one or two Rin Tin Tin films that there's one with the lighthouse and Luis Fazenda is in it. I can't remember the name of it. Doesn't matter. They're all the same. Like the Tom Mix films, there's a formula to them. But but the dog is a good actor, and they sent me the screener. And so what we're going to hear now is a, a few minutes of a moment in the score for the Clash of the Wolves, which will air on Turner Classic Movies as part of the beginning of their celebration of the centennial of Warner Brothers, and. If you happen to be at the Turner Classic Movies uh, Festival, uh, you can skip watching it on TV and come see me play for it at the, the Legion 43 Theater in Hollywood. There is a moment in the middle of this picture where the movie shifts gears and becomes a light comedy for a reel and a half or so. And like we were talking at the beginning of this episode, I noticed this moment happening and realized I, because it happens 30 minutes into the picture you really feel like, oh, this is this kind of picture. Mm. But I felt like the audience needed a little hint to know we're shifting gears. And because basically the setup is that there's been a whole big action sequence because Rin Tin Tin's character, Lobo, is a wolf who is actually uh, wanted by other people and the, the, the people are trying to capture him. And then the, our, uh, the, the male lead in the film is trying to capture him and has a confrontation with him and shoots and wounds him. And then Rin Tin Tin runs away and, and hurts, injures his paw. It's the old thing with the thorn and the paw. Uh, the, the main, our main uh, character feels badly and scoops him up and takes him back to his cabin. So you know, and so, uh, you know not only uh, human actors uh, have to put on monster makeup, uh, they actually yeah. fixed Rin Tin Tin up looking wolfy. He yeah, has a yeah, dental yeah. Appliance, as I recall. Uh, yeah, so so this is this, we have all this action. So where we come in on the score is this moment where we're back at the guy's cabin. He's gotten the thorn out, and he's trying to help the the dog, uh, you know, recuperate. And there's this tender moment, and then 
we have, again, this is one of these things about the silent film universe that a ton of story can be covered in a single two-sentence or one-sentence title. And it just says that over over the weeks, he recuperates and becomes so-and-so's dog. He goes from being a wolf to somebody's pet. Now, there's this whole thing in the recuperation scene where the guy is talking to Ren Tin Tin and how he's injured his paw, and it's, oh, you really need to wear some boots. And you think, oh, that's, yeah, what a cute little line. And then after this transitional title, we fade in on a tracking shot of watching Ren Tin Tin walk. So we are uh, perpendicular to Ren Tin Tin. He's walking. We're traveling along with him. And because it's black and white film, you don't your eyes may not pick it up, but he's wearing little boots that the guy has, has somehow <laughs> fashioned for him. Again, how did that happen? We fade it out and fade it in, and we just go with it. So we see it's a long thing of Rin Tin Tin walking, and that's all it is. And you don't know what the hell is this? What's going on? What kind of a movie is this? Where, you know, again, silent film, there's no wasted screen time. So what information are we being given? So all of a sudden, there's a joke here that Rin Tin Tin is now trying to walk around this western town wearing boots. <laughs> and he said, so I <laughs> right, exactly. And then for the next reel and a half, there's comedy business with the boots. Um, the guys, the main character, sidekick played by the quote unquote comedian uh, known as Heine Conklin, <laughs> who suffers from what I call Monty Banks syndrome, where he looks like a comedian, he dresses like a comedian, he moves like a comedian, but he, I don't think he's funny. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but it, but there's more comedy sequences through, for the next reel and a half, and so I need to let the audience know, okay. Now we're in this territory. And what popped into my head is a, uh, as a suggestion is a piece of music that uh, written by Morton Gould uh, from his American Symphonette No. 2 uh, called Pavan, which there was a record that Morton Gould himself uh, released, got released uh, uh, as a piano solo and then was released also, this is in the 40s, I think, as an orchestral piece. And then... In the 19th, late 50s and early 60s, oh, with all that big spate of instrumental records uh, for the bachelor pad with, with uh, listeners with giant hi-fis, th- this, rec- this song keeps turning up. And it was a cue that Walter Kerr often used for comedy scenes in the compiled scores he had on reel-to-reel tape. So I had this in the back of my head. So and shall we take uh, just uh, a moment to listen to it? Yeah, sure. That's that's Leslie here Pavan by Morton Gould. Yeah. All right, so that's our source piece or inspiration yeah. piece, I should Yeah, inspiration. Say. So um, I didn't play exactly that, but I wanted to have something in that feel so that it goes from, you know, 25 minutes of intrigue and running and fighting and shooting and battling and this sweet tender moment in the cabin and to let people know now we're in light comedy land. So what you'll hear is the end of the sequence in the cabin through the transitional title into this walking music of Rin Tin Tin in the Boots from my uh, or theater organ score for The Clash of the Wolves.
A couple minutes from around the 30-minute mark in Clash of the Wolves, starring Rin Tin Tin, uh, the female lead in the film is June Marlowe. Ah. And if that, na- that name rings a bell, she was Miss Crabtree in the Our Gang shorts. But in the mid-20s, she is the female lead in most of the Rin Tin Tin pictures for Warner Brothers. <laughs> So there's episode 57. We've shifted from live performance to recording scores. Ch- keep watching to see what we do in episode 58. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see what, what, what we wind up doing. <laughs> uh, look forward to seeing folks at, at uh, in-person shows uh, and the occasional live stream. We're still doing the silent comedy watch party every month. Um, but my website's the best way to find out where where I'm apt to be and what I'm up to. And while you're on that website, sign up for the email. It's the best way to know what's going on. This has been the Silent Film Music Podcast with Ben Modell. It's the podcast that takes you inside the mind of somebody as they prepare for, perform, and reflect upon performances of live musical accompaniments to silent film. I'm your host, Ben Modell. I'm a silent film accompanist, composer, historian presenter, educator, home video label, etc. Joined in tandem as I am every time by my friend, co-producer and co-host Kerr Lockhart. It's been fun this month. Folks, if you've listened this long, you probably like this. So please, if you haven't already done so, go to where you get this podcast and rate and review it. That's the best way for other people who might like it to find out about it. Uh, We'll see you. No, we won't see you. Uh, We'll be talking to you (laughs) on the next episode of the Silent Film Music Podcast. Until next time, I'll see you at the silence.